Welcome everybody. This is Mongo's part one. You can find this in Earth and Its People, chapter 12, and World Civilization by Peter Stearns in chapter 14. Let's begin with the quote. The Mongo explosion laid the foundations for more human interactions on a global scale, extending and intensifying the world network that had been building since the classical age. Think about the word explosion and the word more. The Mongol explosion laid the foundation for more human interactions. Uh, explosion is a a very a, a word that describes a very large amount, uh, almost immediately, without notice, and more meaning uh, what adding to what is already there. So. Therefore, these areas of the world had already experienced um, human interactions on a global scale, but the Mongols served to intensify that network that had been building. So really think about how this quote represents the Mongol conquest. Okay, we're going to look at a map of different parts of Asia. Let's go ahead and start with the Middle East, which is Southwest Asia. You need to know Baghdad. Make sure you know that city. Um, the Baghdad will uh, be destroyed several times throughout history. We will be covering one of the destructions of Baghdad today. Over in Uzbekistan, um, Inner Asia. Make sure you know Sam Samarkand. Samarkand is important when we get into the division of the Khanates. Make sure you know Karakoram over in modern day Mongolia, which will serve as the capital of several of the Khans. Make sure you know Moscow in modern day Russia. Um, notice how close Moscow is to the Volga River. And it will be a very important city, um, especially in the decline of the Mongols and the rise of Russia. Here's a timeline of the Mongol conquest. If you can pause this video and look over every, every entry where I have the green star and make sure you understand the rise of the Mongols and their individual conquest of each section of Eurasia. Let's first talk about Mongol culture. The Mongols are from Inner Asia, from the steppes, which are grasslands, so they are nomadic pastoralists who herded goats and sheep. The way they were structured is they were divided into tribes, uh, and these tribes were then divided into clans, and they would... Uh, fight with each other but then they would come together when they felt they were threatened they elected their leader called a khan but there were families who had a lot of power and cre created a council and this council approved the decisions of the khan if they uh, disapproved they could leave the area and sometimes they even did this during warfare it's also important to note that families combine for more power. They did this by arranging marriages of children, and these children were used as pawns for diplomacy, um, for ways to create uh, alliances. And wealthy women actually could gain power through these alliances, and also during the transitions uh, between cons. Um, although the woman um, uh, who was the mother of the Khan or the next Khan could not actually be a Khan. The Mongols embraced a multitude of religions, including Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism, but their core beliefs was based on traditional shamanism, uh, and one of their ideas was world rulership under a Khan, and they believed that a Khan, um, through a shaman, could speak to a mighty god. And that was uh, the core of their religious beliefs. 
They also had slaves um, who were captured or who were escaping starvation and sought refuge with the Mongols. And some families, they, they owned so much wealth that they lived off tribute and focused on warfare. Uh, so in, in some, Mongol culture was militaristic and um, had a lot a, of diversity within it. Several of these points under rulership I've already reviewed on the previous slide. Um, once again, make sure you understand uh, the leadership of a Khan, uh, the role of wealthy and powerful families, the role of tribute in Mongol culture, and how it caused a strong focus on warfare, and the, role, the idea of alliances and how it was used, and the role of women and the how similar... Uh, the role of women was to China, wherein women could gain power through their sons and sons and son-in-laws and father-in-laws. This is a quick overview of the Mongol conquest, and then we'll go into more detail um, later in this lecture. First, they invade kingdoms in China. Then they turned west towards the Islamic world. Finally, they would conquer the kingdoms of Russia. Genghis Khan mobilized the horde, which we'll talk about in a little bit, to invade many countries outside of Mongolia. Uh, Mongols were the most formidable nomadic challenge to the stationary civilizations. We've had this conversation before when we talk about the early um, sedentary civilizations, uh, such as Mesopotamia, and where the nomads uh, created a challenge. Sometimes they would trade with them, and sometimes they would... Uh, pillage the cities. Um, the way the Mongols were able to conquer so much of Eurasia was through their um, improved weaponry, such as a powerful short bow. Uh, they were excellent archers, could fire uh, perfectly from horseback, and they used harsh discipline in their army. They would enforce this using a formal code, and if you did not follow their code, they, you were severely punished, usually by death. And, but if you followed through and were a great warrior, you were greatly rewarded for your conduct. It is important to note the escalation of militarism in Mongol culture, and so we can refer to that as building the Mongol Warshin, which is a title in the Stearns book. It is estimated that 20 to 50 million people were killed during a 30-year period. Um, some of the skills that, like I mentioned before, was archery and horsemen. They were the best armed, most experienced, disciplined mobile soldiers in the world by the 13th century. Some of the techniques they used were mounted warriors um, called two men. They also had a messenger force, uh, like a postal service, and they adopted gunpowder and cannons from China. Here are some great images from a uh, museum, the Fields Museum, dedicated to... Uh, Genghis Khan and the Khan family. Here you have a uh, bow and arrow. One of their most famous bows is called a whistling bow. Um, here is a saddle. Um, here is a model of a Mongol and, and their attire. And here they are on horseback. Keep in mind that they're from the steppes, uh, open grasslands. And this is why they are so good at... Um, um, horseback riding. Over here you have a model display of a trebuchet. A trebuchet is an, an early version of a catapult. Let's start with the first Khan, Kabu Khan. Kabu Khan defeated the Chen forces in 1100 and he was the first to unite tribes in fighting invaders. He introduced diplomacy and negotiating among, among warrior clans and he rivaled and fought the Jin dynasty. His great-grandson was Temujin, um, also known as Chinggis, or Genghis Khan today. Uh, in 1206, Genghis Khan was elected Khan, or supreme ruler. In 1215, he defeated the Jin, and in 1219, he defeated the Karakutai. And if you look here on the map, you can see the area of the Kara Katai Khanate um, around 1200 and by doing this he uh, consolidated um, unity among the Mongolians. 
Around 1220, uh, Genghis Khan was able to defeat the Khwarezm Empire located in modern day Iran. And finally, in 1227, um, Genghis Khan died. And his death was very well covered uh, by uh, a famous traveler, Marco Polo. Um, one of the things that is said, um, uh, is supposedly said by Genghis Khan on his deathbed um, to his sons, his three sons was, with heaven's aid, I have conquered for you a huge empire. But my life was too short to achieve the conquest of the world. That is left for you. And this is a very famous image of Genghis Khan on his deathbed. And then here you have his sons who are surrounding him. This is one of the most I iconic um, images of Genghis Khan. Here is a nice um, illustration of the importance of military campaigns. Um, in Eurasia, you can see, follow the lines where uh, tribes were united by Genghis Khan. You can see the early boundaries of the Mongol Empire um, and the final boundaries of the Mongol Empire. You can see the campaigns um, that were also led by Kublai Khan and Batu. Ugude was Genghis's third son, and he was elected Khan after... Uh, Genghis died and he completed the conquest of northern China and then began threatening the Song Dynasty. Um, this is where Song Dynasty will move to southern Song and his capital was at Karakoram in modern-day Mongolia and um, in 1241 his death is what saves Europe from destruction. Um, if it wasn't for his death the Mongols would have taken even more land. In the image on the left, you can see this is the uh, a palace there at Karakoram, and it's one of the famous images of the ancient city. In 1246, Giyik was elected Great Khan with the help of his mother. We talked about um, how mothers could gain power um, through their sons, and he conquered Baghdad and executed the last Abbasid Caliph in 1258. Um, and which is um, the last caliph um, even up to modern day times. He was a Nor Nestorian Christian and Nestorians were seen, uh, it was seen as an act of heresy uh, by Western Europeans. Um, however, uh, Giyik did favor Christian advisors and so his, the relationship between Christianity and Mongols uh, was very strong um, throughout the Middle East. The relationship between the Mongols and the Islamic world uh, is also important to note. Um, the empire that's going to be established there by the Mongols is known as the Ilkhan State, and that's going to encompass the areas of Mesopotamia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Iran. And when the Mongols arrived, they uh, converted to Islam, and they were able to ally with uh, Pope Nicholas, and um, in the Golden Horde, which is Russia, <clears throat> they allied with Muslim Mamluks in Egypt. Keep in mind that the Mamluks were a uh, group of slaves, Turkic slaves, who will create a, sl a uh, slave dynasty in Egypt. Um, there's also a conflict with Buddhism because many Mongols were Buddhist, and um, this conflicted with is the Islamic doctrine. You also have state policies based on um, Islamic ideas such as tax farming. Um, by using tax farming, the Mongols were able to contract out um, the ability to collect taxes and so many farmers moved um, off their land onto um, a, a, an estate by a wealthy family and so the tax base shrank and there was an attempt for paper currency which um, ultimately failed. These are some of the negative and positive consequences of the Mongols' role in the Muslim world. Some of the negative uh, impacts were conquest of Mesopotamia and North Africa, the capturing and destruction of Baghdad in 1258. Um, there was uh, over 800,000 people killed, including the Abbasid Caliph who was executed. 
1243, they had a victory over the Sojuk Turks, which opened Asia Minor to another powerful group of Turks known as the Ottomans, who will actually establish legitimacy in 1453 and will not fall until World War I. Um, the Mongol conquest of the Islamic world is known as the greatest catastrophe in the history of Islam. Um, and they uh, were finally defeated by the Mamluks in 1260. Some positives were uh, the fact that the Mongols taught new ways of warfare to many societies, uh, and such as gunpowder. They also traded between both ends of Eurasia, and they also protected trade routes. So there was an increase in economic prosperity across Eurasia. But there is also a negative side to this as the Black uh, Death the bubonic plague spread across these trade routes. It's important to talk about uh, the role of uh, nomadic invaders from Asia who were um, important um, during this time period. One, one of the groups were the Turks who were related to the Mongols. 1348, they sacked Delhi over in modern day India um, and established an Islamic um, base there. Okay, so over in Uzbekistan, you have um, Samarkand, uh, which was used as the capital of um, Timurlane Empire, uh, also known as Timur, also known as Tamerlane, and Timurlang. And he brought scholars, artists, and craftsmen um, to Samarkand. Um, another important topic is how the Turks captured Persia, Fertile Crescent, India, and Southern Russia. In 1402, Timur, who led the Turks, attempted to march on China, but that did fail. Um, he's known for his brutality and destruction, so kind of seen as a copycat of the Mongols. He had a very brief rule because um, after his death, his empire dissolved, and this ended the invasions of steppe nomads in Eurasia. There is much to be said about cultural achievements, um, in the Mongol world, there were historians, um, there was uh, mathematicians, uh, you had a, a lot of um, work in, in uh, about the cosmos, uh, poetry and ethics. Um, there is the first one of the first early histories recorded is over the rise and death of Genghis Khan. And for math, you have the decimal notation, you have things like pi becoming more accurate. For cosmology, you have um, lunar uh, calendar, observational astronomy, which predicted eclipses, and then those types of works were translated to Arabic by Mamluks. The Byzantine monks translated the works to Greek. Christian scholars in Muslim Spain translated to Latin. The Sultan of Delhi translated to Sanskrit. So this um, translation of these works represents the ultimate cultural diffusion. The picture on the left is uh, a, an image of Marco Polo's account of his visit to Kublai Khan's um, court over in China, which we will cover next lecture. But it is important to note this under culture because um, courts are very important in the social life of the Mongol elites. The most commonly traded items in the Mongol Empire was um, silk and porcelain, which are luxury goods. You also have a movement of people across the trade routes, um, merchants, ambassadors, scholars, and missionaries. You also have the journey of the famous uh, traveler Marco Polo, who, as I said previously, visited the Mongol court, and his accounts were both factual and fantasy. One of the effects of Marco Polo's accounts that he took back to Europe was the emphasis on the search for a new trade route. Um, which is going to lead to um, maritime trade and exploration. Bubonic plague also went along the trade route, and this began in the early Tang, China, travel by ship, and it was known collectively as the Great Pandemic, in including um, smallpox, typhus, and influenza. And the plague, plus the Mongol terror, traumatized many Europeans and led them to believe that they were being punished by God. Here is a um, visual map of the spread of the Black Death through Afro-Eurasia. So if you would pause this and um, really um, think about how this um, transfer 
of disease um, symbolizes the linkage of global networks. The Mongols in Russia. So, um, the armies of the Golden Horde swept westward till they reached Poland and Russia. And this was led by the great Khan Bahatu, uh, who defeated the Russians in 1236, creating a unified state. If the kingdoms um, paid tribute, um, usually in the form of goods, um, it could be homage, um, then they were spared. And they were taken care of. So um, these pr Russian princes who uh, followed through and paid homage to the Mongols um, were favored. Um, and they were enlisted to be tax collectors and census takers. However, over time, uh, the Mongol rule became decentralized and they lost power as the Khanates split into s smaller Khanates. This is exemplified by the White Horde in Southeast Russia and the Crimean Khanate. Um, when you look at um, the Mongols, um, one of the most uh, powerful princes who... Um, rose after Mongol rule was Ivan the Third, and he uses the word czar, which was usually uh, reserved for foreign rulers. Um, but he used it in order to legitimize his rule after the decline of the Khanates. If you look at the time period of Ivan the Third's reign, it began in 1462 which was um, only nine years after the decline of, uh, and the collapse of the Byzantine Empire in 1453 uh, by the arrival of the Ottoman Turks. So it is important to understand your global context. Um, looking here, you can see the Empire of the Golden Horde. Notice um, to the north, um, the green area of the Russian principalities that have um, been able to maintain their own control outside of the Mongols um, were actually um, ignored by the Mongols. You have uh, former uh, Russian cities like Kiev um, who were looked over in favor for um, places around Crimea uh, and along the Volga River. Also important is to notice how close Hungary and Anatolia were to the Mongol conquest and almost being um, swallowed into the great Eurasian Empire. As I said, Kiev, um, which was a, an intrapot, uh, an intrapot is defined as a city where which serves as a distribution point um it was controlled continuously by a powerful princely family and they maintain traditional local structure um some changes in russia include cities languages and economy for example you have the rise of moscow um, over in the Russian language, you, Russian becomes dominant over the church Slavic language. You have a flow of gold and silver to the Mongols, and so there's less precious metal in the economy, and you have the failure of paper money. The picture here on the right is Novgorod, which was one of the most um, powerful and important entrepots in the uh, Mongolian Russian Empire. Just like the Middle East, the Mongols also had both negative and positive impacts um, in Russia. Um, some of the negative impacts is the rise of feudalism as peasants sought protection from the nobility. Uh, they abandoned their lands. Uh, Russia is also isolated from the Reformation and the Renaissance. Um, the Ukraine, specifically Kiev, goes into decline, although some historians believe that was already occurring prior to the arrival of the Mongols. You have the cessation of coinage, and uh, they revert back to a barter system. Um, taxes were paid mostly by the peasants in gold and silver, while princes exempted themselves. Some positive impacts were the gains from trade were sometimes greater than the tribute payment. Um, oftentimes, uh, many people in Russia were better off under Mongol rule than under traditional uh, Russian rule. You also have the rise of Moscow, 
which is a continuity all the way till today. Um, there's religious tolerance um, and, because the Mongols believed in diverse religions. And Russia was protected by the Mongols from other attackers. Looking at this image of Eastern Europe, this map, you're able to see how the Mongol Empire um, in the east is beginning to encroach on Europe. Um, one of its nearby neighbors was the Holy Roman Empire, and one of the leaders, Frederick II, respected Muslim culture, and he would negotiate with uh, Muslims to regain land um, in the Holy Land. The current Pope had threatened to excommunicate him and demanded a crusade. If you look to the north, um, in orange, you have the Teutonic Knights. And the Teutonic Knights were German warriors who wanted to Christianize the Slavic people uh, around their area. And um, because of a lack of protection in many of the Slavic lands, um, they actually turned to Russia who was already being controlled by the Mongols for protection um, from these knights. Uh, Nevisky, for example, joined the Mongols to protect the Slavic territory. All right, the last topic for this lecture is the Mongols' impact on Europe. Um, one of the key ideas in um, Mongol history is their tolerance of others and the diversity of their culture. Uh, one of the examples is how diverse the Mong Mongol armies were, um, which included Turks, Chinese, Iranians, and Europeans, and even included an Englishman. Um, they also had the idea of ambassadors, uh, which are still used today. Ambassadors were diplomats or people who sought negotiation rather than war. They were sent to Mongol courts and returned with intelligence. Some of the ideas brought back to Europe or diplomatic passports, mining, movable type, high temperature metallurgy, advanced mathematics, gunpowder, and after the 14th century, you have bronze canyons. Well, everybody, this is the end of the Mongol lecture part one. Next lecture will be over the Mongols' impact in China and early Ming China. In interactions, uh, explosion is a a very a, a word that describes a very large amount, uh, almost immediately, without notice, and more meaning uh, what adding to what is already there. So, therefore, these areas in, of the world had already experienced um, human interactions on a global scale, but the Mongols serve to intensify that network that had been building. So really think about how this quote represents the Mongol conquest. Okay, we're going to look at a map of different parts of Asia. Let's go ahead and start with the Middle East, which is Southwest Asia. You need to know Baghdad. Make sure you know that city. Welcome everybody. This is Mongols part one. You can find this in Earth and Its People, chapter 12, and World Civilization by Peter Stearns in chapter 14. Let's begin with the quote. The Mongol explosion laid the foundations for more human interactions on a global scale, extending and intensifying the world network that had been building since the classical age. Think about the word explosion and the word more. The Mongol explosion laid the foundation for more human. Um, the Baghdad will uh, be destroyed several times throughout history. We will be covering one of the destructions of Baghdad today.
over in Uzbekistan, um, Inner Asia. Make sure you know Sam Samarkand. Samarkand is important when we get into the division of the Khanates. Make sure you know Karakoram over in modern day Mongolia, which will serve as the capital of several of the Khans. Make sure you know Moscow in modern day Russia. Um, notice how close Moscow is to the Volga River, and it will be a very important city, um, especially in the decline of the Mongols and the rise of Russia. Here's a timeline of the Mongol conquest. If you can pause this video and look over every warfare. It's also important to note that families combine for more power. They did this by arranging marriages of children, and these children were used as pawns for diplomacy, um, for ways to create alliances. And wealthy women actually could gain power through these alliances and also during the transitions uh, between Khans. Um, although the woman um, uh, who was the mother of the Khan or the next Khan could not actually be a Khan. The Mongols embraced a multitude of religions, including Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism, but their core beliefs was based on traditional shamanism, uh, and one of their ideas was world rulership under a Khan, and they believed that a Khan, um, through a shaman, could speak to a mighty god. And that was uh, the core of their religious beliefs. Every entry where I have the green star, and make sure you understand the rise of the Mongols and their individual conquest of each section of Eurasia. Let's first talk about Mongol culture. The Mongols are from Inner Asia from the steppes, which are grasslands, so they are nomadic pastoralists who herded goats and sheep. The way they were structured is they were divided into tribes, uh, and these tribes were then divided into clans, and they would uh, fight with each other, but then they would come together when they felt they were threatened. They elected their leader, called a Khan, but there were families who had a lot of power and cre created a council, and this council approved the decisions of the Khan. If they uh, disapproved, they could leave the area, and sometimes they even did this during 